Welcome to Circus and Changing Realities 2020, a series of virtual dialogues about the future of circus. I'm your moderator, Jonathan Lee Iverson. This is a wake up call for inclusion. Now for some within the circus industry, such a subject matter might sound strange as the famous narrative of the circus industry is one of renowned diversity. In fact, many would even say among all entertainment genres, no other has been a greater beacon for welcoming men and women of every stripe, gender, tongue, culture, and ability like the circus. However, what you see is not always what you get. And diversity doesn't necessarily translate to inclusion. Therefore, the diversity of bodies and talents in the circus industry also boasts a diversity of unique experiences, some of which might not corroborate the popular belief about life under the big top. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this very important conversation. Please welcome our distinguished panel. So I'm gonna ask these wonderful ladies and gentlemen to introduce themselves. Please state your name, your country of origin, the country you're in, and of course, your work in the circus sector. Let's start with Noelle, since she's the most famous of us all. <laughs> Not really, maybe I'm just like the biggest loud mouth to be honest. <laughs> but um, hi, I'm Noelle, I am originally from California, so America, but I am now based in Montreal, Canada. Um, I am mainly an aerialist and I've worked for companies such as Acrobatic Conundrum and Cirque du Soleil and, um, and I am a new YouTuber. <laughs> a famous YouTuber. You're starting trouble online. I've shared your stuff. It's beautiful. <laughs> Next up, uh, Joseph. Hi, my name is Joseph Pinzon from Los Angeles, California, which is where I am right now. I am the founder and creative producer of Short Round Productions, which is a contemporary circus company based here from LA and also an aerialist. And it's great to be here. Awesome. Welcome, Joseph. And Marco Mota. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marco Mota. I'm from Brazil and I live in Spain and uh, I do iris straps and contortion in 10 years of breakdance. And, and good to be here. Too. Well, welcome Marco. And of course, now last but not least, I'm not even gonna butcher your name, but she is something else because I stalk her on Instagram. Oh. My wife doesn't know about it. But it is wonderful. So I'll let you introduce yourself. There you go. Um, hi, I'm Majo. Um, I am Mexican Colombian and I live in Brussels. I've been living in Belgium for like eight years. Uh, I, I was performer and a co director and production manager for Naga Collective. Uh, and I'm a floor person, like acro dance, and I do some hand to hand flying when I haven't thrown a knife on my foot. Wonderful. Well, welcome. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll start with our questions. And, um, you know, everyone has, uh, uh, you know, just a few minutes to please answer as you see fit. As the genre of the circus prides itself, of course, on being a bastion of inclusion and a fraternity. Has this been your experience? No. <laughs> <laughs> It had not. Um, it, it's, you know, I went to ENC in Montreal and, you know, it's, I, you know, when you're in that world, you're kind of just concentrated on getting through because it's so strenuous and so difficult and you're in pain and emotionally it's taxing. But to top it all off, to look around and see that no one's like you, it, it gets to you. And what, what's harder is when you start voicing that and you're not being listened to because either they don't get it or they don't see that it's a big deal, which is exactly why we are where we are, like because of privilege. And 
I've had to keep my mouth shut a lot because of fear of not having employment, fear of being blacklisted by a company or to have people in higher positions not want to work with me because of something I said, because I'm seem, I seem difficult. And so it, it's like a catch 22. It's like, I can't win and be authentically who I would love to be in this industry that I work so hard to be in, if not harder than a lot of the people in there because of the challenges that I've had. Yet I had to keep my head down and just go with the flow. And trust me, I've said things and if they haven't been heard, it's because people weren't listening. And that's not my fault. You know, I like, like everyone, we've been trying to say things for such a long time. And it's such a shame that it's taken this, like this long and is attributed to events that are so tragic for us to be where we are. So is it fair here? Maybe? No, it's not. Look who's on stage. You know? So. Anyone else? Um, well, I, I went to school here in Brussels and that was a really strange experience because when, when you're in Europe or like in Zach, where there's very few Belgians, you have the impression that everybody's from somebody somewhere else, but a majority is European. So they're not born there, but they have a different situation from yours. I was, I went to school at a sort of transitional period where we started to be a lot of Latinos, uh, coming to schools, uh, in Europe, uh, Actually, like the ones that grew up watching you, Joe, on YouTube, like, are like, oh, there's people who do this. How cool is that? Like, I, uh, like we started in the 2000s, like, whoa, this is so cool. Uh, and then we started coming, you know, like you save money and you're like, okay, this is a real job. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, uh, the European Union is a very strange place where uh, there's this thing of like, oh, but racism and segregation is an, an American thing. We don't have that here. Like, it's not a thing in here, except that it really is and uh, i'm in brussels which is an incredibly diverse and cosmopolitan city you go into the streets and you see all kinds of faces all kinds of accents and languages and then you go to the theater and it's a completely different world uh, it doesn't reflect the streets and um yeah my experience in circus is also that as as, as you said joseph like uh you have all this situation and it's hard to find people who relate to them or also you don't want to seem problematic because also there's kind of this vibe of uh, circuses about poetry and beauty and not politics and it's an escape for people and you have it has to be pleasant so you don't it's like you have already so many things against you that you don't want to add to that by being like making people uncomfortable so uh it's weird. At the same time, I was I went to school with a lot of Latinos, and we did have each other's back, and we understood what it is to have to renew your visas every year, to be brown, to etc. And uh, or to yeah. So, but it it's been weird, and I don't think people spoke about it very much when I was in school eight years ago. Really, it's starting up now. That's my experience again. All right. Um, so in my experience, I've actually never gone to like a, an official like circus school or anything. So I've really been growing up in, growing up in the circus world in different training studios. And I actually only just started six years ago. So I'm, I am relatively new and I am learning like more of the history of, of, of the people that came before me. And, but just as like sort of this newcomer in the industry, it's, it's even in, I, I mainly trained in LA at first, it's, even even though LA is a diverse place, it's not there. There was no one who's Filipino, and there's nobody. I, I'm Filipino. Joe, you're the only other. Like you are one of the only Filipinos I know in this industry, straight up. And like it's, it's, it's. Okay, so it's hard to see yourself become a performer when you don't have anyone who looks like you on stage. And especially as as a female aerialist, where where body types do ma do matter, uh, and I'm learning that as I as I as I created this video and the response I've been getting, where body types do matter apparently to these to peep to to higher up people, um, and and your look matters. Your look matters so much to 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 these people that are are casting these shows, and and to not be able to see 
yourself rep represented on stage, it's it's hard to envision yourself as a performer and it's hard for coaches to believe in you and invest in you. And so I was very, very fortunate where, you know, I went to different training studios, but there was this one coach who's like, this girl has fire, this girl has spirit, and I don't care what she looks like, I don't care what her body type is, I'm gonna invest in this girl and I'm gonna put my heart and soul into her. And honestly, that coach is is probably the reason why I kept going. It's because I was lucky enough to have someone who believed in me, whereas I'm hearing so many stories now. And even in my own experience, I, I wanted to walk out every day and be like, I'm done, I'm over it. But it, it's so important to have someone who looks like you on stage so that you know you can do it and that you know that you matter, that your voice matters. And and that's something that I learned just, just being in, in these different training environments, like throughout America when I coach, when I coach like in America and in Canada, you know, these people of color come up to me and they're like, I've never seen a performer like you on stage or I've never had a person of color coach me before. Like, thank God there's a person of color who is who is a coach in this industry. And I'm like, oh, like, what is <laughs> like, I just I it, it just blows my mind. And understood. Yeah. yeah and okay. that's okay. that's my piece. <laughs> no, I hear you. Senor. Hola. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a bit complicated, no, because I'm come from a, a completely different world. I'm b-boy for seven years before seven. Uh, yeah, six years before starting in in circles. And when I'm starting circles, I'm always listening the same. No, you don't have technique. You don't have what you do is not circles. It's kind of a strange dance in the air, but it's, that's that's not the real thing. And uh, but uh, why do people say that? Because my concept of static is other. When you are b-boying uh, or break dancer, you you definitely you don't have the same idea of what's beautiful and what's not. You know what I mean? And uh, when I'm start working or do festivals, I definitely feel alone. <laughs> I'm always the unique black person in the casting, in the cast or or in the festival. It ends, yeah. And always is super sad because I try to find uh, some references to start to create something new. Obviously, like. I don't know. I have all my references in circus words. This is not all, but it's, it's white people, you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, that's that's super hot. And uh, always when I try to say something more politic about the racism and everything like that, uh, the, the people try to cover my mouth because mm. I always say me the same. The people come here to 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 show like something entertained. I think the word, I don't know. and not to 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 listen you speak about the suffering of, or or right, stuff right. like that. So, so yeah, I'm I feel that's what I feel when I'm starting circles, and I'm still feeling safe. This is interesting so, yeah. because I want to touch on what you just expressed, Marco, and what you just expressed, Noelle, there's a um, connection here. You mentioned the aesthetic, the body type. Marco mentioned when he was beginning, the criticism he would get was it wasn't the standard, so to speak. It wasn't, it wasn't what was expected, which is ironic in a, an art form that literally is built on individual genius. And so this brings me to my next question. Do you believe most of your challenges in the circus industry as an artist center solely around your ethnicity or race, or are there other factors, meaning maybe they're just, just blithely ignorant to the different body parts so they or body types or or the culture 
in Marco's case, the culture in which he is expressing himself. So it's just an ignorance, or do you think it is it is racially based, or I guess it's a racially based ignorance? I mean, what 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 are your what is your take on that? I hope that's a clear question. <laughs> yes, Joseph. yeah, I I think it's a combination of things. It's like if you don't know that it's wrong, you won't know that it's wrong. And you won't know if it's wrong if it's not being said. And if everything around you is okay and you're part of that okay, then that's it. You know, you don't have to speak up. Um, is it racially biased? I, I think it's more of a, if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. It's, I don't think it's pointed. I mean, who, who knows? Like I've experienced my own things and whether it was intended or not for it to be racially biased or discriminatory, it, it felt like it, you know? Um, and that that's also a problem. If some people don't see that what they're saying can be viewed as that, they don't have to because they have that privilege to not see it that way and to just dismiss it as if, oh, you're being overreactive, you're being sensitive. And I'm like, well, if I said certain things about certain cultures and certain people, they'd have a field day with me and then I'd be ostracized. So it's hypocritical. And, you know, I, I would hope that it's not racially biased. I, I you know, with, with form and everything, it's really strange. Circus is such a young art form and we're trying to be more and more established as a legitimate art form that can be recognized by governmental institutions so we can get funding and all that stuff. So in order to be there, I feel like we have this mindset that it has to be elevated. And what's elevated are ideas of what high art is. Mm. And high art is seen as classical music and classical dance because that's the pinnacle of excellence. But even the term classical is Eurocentric, you know, because it totally disregards, you know, classical African history and art, classical Asian stuff. You know, it's like, well, what's that then? Is that just deemed ethnic? So classical is white and Eurocentric. So these lines that we need that most white people can get, but some cultures and ethnicities, ethnic bodies cannot ever get are deemed ineligible for excellence. It's, it's a thing, it's a huge thing. It's a dismantling of the entire idea of what is considered to be high art and you know excellent art. It, it, you gotta think of it of a different way and it's a shame that bodies who are more than capable of doing the skills just because they look a certain way are discarded. Like I, I, I'll admit that I'm stuck in there because I grew with it in my educational institution and I did ballet growing up so I know these lines and I'm fortunate that my body can get those. I, I'm lucky, I'm very lucky. Was it torn apart? Sure was, but I got there and I, I, I didn't have that, but I, ha I had the form, so I got away with a lot. And there are some bodies that just can't, but it's, it's a shame when I, you see white bodies who also have the same problems and they're never dinged on it. Hmm. You know, they're never said, oh, your form's bad. You know, th they'll, they'll still get the jobs and there won't be any excuse about it. They'll be like, oh, they're fine. You know, that, that, there's, a, there's an injustice there, definitely. Would everyone say that their experiences are similar to um, Joseph's? And yes, yeah. Oh, sorry, Maho. You can you speak, Maho? Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely. So for me, the circus arts is totally Eurocentric in the aesthetic way. No, in all ways. <laughs> and uh, definitely, yeah, because it's like I said, for I, I come from from all. all completely different world, uh, the hip hop world. It's like a black community, uh, how how you move your body is completely different. Your idea of aesthetic is different. And when I'm arrived in circles, always the people say, no, you need to put your feet like that. And I say, okay, I trained in 10 years, my feet like that, what's the problem? You know what I mean? What What's the problem? I do really hard tricks. I do crazy stuff, you try to do. The, in, that's the idea of circles, no? Do something hard, something, something crazy to the people. Say, whoa, that that's huge. But I, I, I don't feel 
because for example when i do festivals i'm away i'm always feel the same i'm a, the people always say me the same like marco you need training your technique and i say okay stop a minute uh, what's technique technique is is when you do something to don't hurt yourself in my conception of technique so i never hurt myself i have both shoulders okay both knees okay everything my body's okay so why i need changing my body language to adapting my black body to this eurocentric idea of cool this is happens with the jazz too mm. and the and the 50s and 30s at the at the at the music critics say the jazz is the sound of animals or or weird stuff like that but right now jazz when when the the people listen jazz they start to feel like a, a scholar like you know what i mean <laughs> because the the conception uh, the idea of music statics changing and i think is we needed a, a change this idea and how we can do that change we body movements we need change that we can't still do the same ages and ages and just say no it's because i can't do just change it I try to 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 took it off of the mind the idea of this idea in concrete of static is nothing wrong with that it's just different you need to try to do something different different so that's what i think about that, that thing it's totally true the circus is eurocentric so uh, we need to uh, try to decolonize these ideas how would you see that uh, maho um so oh i have, I have so many notes uh i mean for me i think it's hard to dissociate the fact that i am a person of color from the fact that i'm a woman and i'm an immigrant so at some point it's kind of blurry because it's like to which degree am i treated like this because i'm brown and to which degree because i'm a woman when like a majority of people in power in circus are also men etc so like at some point i'm like i don't know which one comes from where and i would say like i agree with marco like um we're actually doing a project on this but uh i think like a colonization starts for me in my head i come from a former colony mexico has a heritage of colonialism and colorism and we are the first ones to uh to grow up in a context where like you know i haven't i haven't left uh, mexico when i already had this mindset of european is better white is better that's what's prettier like you know ballet is a higher form of art than folkloric dance mm. uh um which of course comes from europe but uh then you come here and you're in that this really dissociated kind of mindset um and for me so it was also strange because i have a particular experience of i, I did a french school so I started learning French at age six. I, you know, I learned, I had had Spanish classes in French in Mexico. And uh, it's really bizarre, like it's really bizarre. But so it happened that then I ended up in Belgium, in like a French, the French part of Belgium. And uh, I don't have broken French. I speak really, really way too clean French sometimes. And it's with this thing of like people kind of expected me maybe to, have a broken accent or to be stupid. At some point I was working with uh, white Northern Europeans in a project and it wouldn't be, I really felt that for example, people expected them to be this, the brains behind the project and me being like a brown Latino immigrant to just be like a funny cartoon that was like tagging along for the ride when I was doing, when I was doing the majority of the work and I was writing the text and people were like, oh, but this like, you know, like they're Norwegian and Finnish and she's Mexican. Like, and there was this, and I was like, I, I'm, I, I wrote that, <laughs> you know, uh, and like my colleagues were great. They're smart people, but I, yeah, that, that is just this association of like, just because I come from somewhere and I look a certain way, I'm assumed to be stupid or um, maybe in other ways also, maybe sometimes it's very, um, narrow um but in not necessarily like a bad way i've been told also like oh but you're latino you're like passion and that's why you're so strong and passionate on stage because we come from latin america and i'm like <laughs> no that's because i'm a good actress i've worked on that like what are you saying like and then like there's this 
typical thing of like uh, Latina Caliente or like I've literally had that on cabarets on stage when the MC will say like blah 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 Marco she comes from Mexico and I once entered on stage to do a, like a really conceptual abstract thing and I was welcomed on stage by the audience shouting ay 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 and I did my thing and then I just went out of stage and cried because it was just like it was really heartbreaking uh, but this thing of like Mexican cartoon Latina Caliente drugs that's often how like if I don't talk with the MC beforehand, that's maybe how I'm presented, you know, like. Uh, you said a very important word, though. You said colonization. And, I did. <laughs> and so I, I'm thinking in, in the span of this conversation thus far with you, you all's unique experiences, it does have that single thread of colonization. And so are we talking about colonization of really it, it just in, envelops everything you know I guess how they would interpret what an aesthetic is how they would interpret what a Latina is or what a black man is you know the fact that you know they would see a hip-hop aesthetic which is very organic it's from the streets and not be able to even put that within the colony I mean it's the whole purpose of colonization is to impose your standards in your ways and your customs upon the foreign. And so in, in many respects, I guess what we're looking at and what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is a colonization of really your absolute, um, your essence, your, your, um, your authenticity. You know, so you run up against this wall where you're invited into this place called circus that professes, hey, we welcome this hospital, this diversity, this inclusion, but you're saying over and over again, if I'm hearing everybody correct, this is not the case because you're bringing your flavor. And then you're telling, well, take this piece out of it. Is that, is that what we're, is that what we're constantly experiencing? Um, I, I don't know if they're saying take that piece out of it because sometimes they exploit it. Um, mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Uh, so, um, and this is not to disparage any experience that I had, it's just what I felt and what I went through. So I was in a show with uh, El Waz, Cirque El Waz called Nebia. And I was very, I loved that show. I loved being in that show. I've been very fortunate to have been a part of it, to be selected from auditions that, that you know, many, many talented people. And I'm so grateful they chose me. And at a certain point in the creation process, they're like, Joe, we need you to learn Kung Fu. And I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, why? And they're like, well, we, we they, there's an idea for an act and you know, we want you to learn Kung Fu. I'm like, why don't you let the other people learn Kung Fu? I already have to learn like four acts in the show. Why are you giving me another one? And why this, you know? And they're like, oh, we just think it might be, you know, funny. And I'm like, okay. So we go along, we go along, we go along. And you know, it, it ends up evolving into a comedy thing. And I'm like, oh God, it, because it just became so caricature, you know? And I, and I asked people, I'm like, are you, did you give me that because you thought I was gonna be funny at it? Or did you give me that because I'm here and this is here? Because somebody else can do this act, you know? And they're like, oh, but it won't be as, as, as effective if it's not you. And I'm like, okay, I see. And I, and I expressed my concerns to people on the creative team and even some of my castmates. And, they didn't see it as a big deal. They're like, oh, Joe, it's funny. You know, it's just, you know, don't take it so seriously. You're being a little sensitive and, you know, it's a joke. And I'm like, if it's a joke, why is it not funny to me? And I'm the one that has to tell this joke. Like, that's not cool. And, you know, people heard it, but nothing happened. I, I still had to do it. And um, I love the show, except that act. You know, like every time I had to put on that costume, it was a kung fu outfit. I felt like it felt like being a minstrel, to be quite honest. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, you're you're having a joke at like I'm not even Chinese. I'm Filipino. Like we don't do kung fu unless we like go to a school and learn. It's not part of our culture, but visually, it doesn't matter. You see this, you're gonna get this. But I mean, like, and and you know, I didn't speak up too much about it because it's the same thing I mentioned at the beginning. I just got the job. I didn't want to lose it. You know, I already had a hard enough time trying to land a job in this industry, which is a whole nother story. We have time, we'll get into that. But I did it. I did it for two years. I didn't say anything. And it hurt. It hurt to have to do that. But I mean, I will say I took the power back because I'm like, if I'm going to do this 
for two years, I'd better at least do it in a way that I feel okay with. And I was allowed to like yell things or act like, you know, Kung Fu master yelling and screaming. So I took it upon myself to learn phrases in various Asian languages and yell them throughout the entire act at the audience and people that were in the act. And unless you are that culture, you will have no idea what I was yelling. And I did that for two years and that felt good. But um, <laughs> it was the only way I could take ownership over what this is because I'm like, if they're gonna see it as a joke, then I'm gonna have fun at this too. Cause this is at my expense and now I'm gonna enjoy this at everyone else's expense. Because wow. how's that for being fair? You know, no one said anything about that because any, no one knew, so. So that brings us to that interesting dilemma where you're stuck between, you know, I wanna do what I love, I'm hungry and I know they're using me as a puppet. I know they're not using my full humanity. They're, I have to be a minstrel. So I'm, I'm curious to know, have you all personally had to challenge a company's ownership or management uh, in regards to their issues with inclusion and diversity? Well, I, um, I haven't so much, but I, I do remember also being scared to bring up these kind of issues. I was once in a show in Switzerland and uh, there were these two clowns, they were white and American, and they had a joke that was like putting a beard and doing like, oh, la, 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 la. I don't think, but whatever, like an imitation of uh, Jewish singing and dancing. And they were like, oh, you cannot do that because we're in Switzerland and like, you know, but then doing a moment where they joked uh, about uh, putting a sombrero and putting like a caracha and doing playing piñata was completely okay. And I, well, mm. yeah, I did have that moment of like, I, I did want to ask like, why, why is it wrong to make fun of Jewish, but we can make fun of Mexicans as much as we want. And also like, I do have a particular issue with that because I've seen in the past years so many shows where the comic relief moment is somebody with a sombrero and like a caracha or playing piñata. And it's really productive and it's really tiring. And it's like, great when you need like a cheap moment of funny, easy humor, you just play Mexican and like I, I, I with pistols and a sombrero. And um, I think for me it's more like at some point there's not enough Mexicans doing things to balance out that huge stereotype about Mexicans just being like little Beaner cartoons, um, but I guess like until very recently, I just wouldn't dare speak out. And in some contexts, I still don't because I'm I want to eat and I want to work. Um, so I think like it also comes with a certain amount of privilege as well to be able to close yourself some doors because you know you won't starve. And uh, I hope for also one day I get to that point personally. Um, but yeah, I personally haven't dared to speak out much or to be like. Am I the only one who notices that the only people of color are like basically like African troops playing African or like uh, Chinese acts coming from like China circus school? Like, am I the only one who notices that we're in Europe and like people are very multiracial and multicultural out there, but like literally everyone here is white? Like, no one, no, no, only one? Okay. Um, yeah, like, I don't know, that happens a lot. Um, no, that's not. Understood. That's an, any anyone else, Marco. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Ellie, you're first because I speak a lot. No, Ellie. <laughs> um, thank you. Gentlemen. <laughs> well, I made a video. <laughs> um, and honestly. So I'm Filipino. My parents taught me from a very young age, you don't speak out, keep your head down. If, if anybody like says any racist stuff to you, you keep your head down, have the blinders and you keep moving forward because you need to go step by step by step. And you're, and that's how you're, you're going to, you're, that's how you're going to rise in whatever industry you choose. They didn't want me to do circus, but like they, they thought I was going to be like a doctor or something, but they're like in every step you chose, <laughs> uh, you choose. Um, <laughs> But, and, 
And so when I started Circus later than everybody else, and I started at, at 21, and you know, I, I didn't have like a dance or gymnastics. I was a figure skater for most of my life, but that didn't help with my arm strength as an aerialist. I had to gain that. I had to, you know, be and just, I had to keep those blinders on. You, you have to. And even if, um, I know my video, I said that there have been, in, that like, in mo I was very fortunate where it, it did feel very much like a, like a family in, in all of the training spaces I've been to, but there actually has been instances where there has been like, oh, that's Asian music playing. Like, that's your people, Noelle, ha ha ha. And then, and then um, my friend actually once said to me like, Noelle, like, do you want me to call that out? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like this is, this the person that said it is, is someone higher up than me. I respect this person. I love this person. Like, no, 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 it, it's fine. I'll let it roll off my back. And, and it's instances like these where I, I, I've experienced stuff like that. I've seen people tokenized um, on stage for their cultures where, where you know, um, like, for instance, um, like in the example I give in my own video, where in this show, in this show that I, I, I auditioned for, um, I would later find out that the black acrobats could only play that role and they couldn't play any other roles um, because they didn't, this this director didn't like that look, and um, it, it seeing it's it's and and sort of coming to Montreal. Uh, no offense, Montreal, but just seeing these sort of different stereotypes of of aerialists. Like this is what an aerialist looks like. This is what a flyer looks like. This is what a base looks like, and 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 not seeing any diversity there. I, I've been silently keeping this to myself for this whole time that I'm noticing all of these, these, these gaps between what is seen in real life with what is represented on stage. And I've always known it's wrong. I've always wanted to speak up when I started my YouTube channel. Um, I started my YouTube channel in April, but I've been practicing with a camera since January, like learning how to speak in front of a camera um, ever since January, really. like. I was intending to make this YouTube channel and I wanted to make this video so bad. And it, it's actually one of the first videos I ever thought of um, to, to really, to share with the circus industry, you know, that there is racism. There is, is, there is this look on stage that, that sometimes you can't control because of your race. Um, I think that's what people don't understand. Um, and and I, I wanted to make this video so bad, but I, seen it time and time again, culture being appropriated, my own experiences, people being tokenized on stage and stereotyped that, that it's dismissed, that racism is dismissed in this industry. And why would I speak up if it's being dismissed? And, you know, when, when the Black Lives Matter movement happened and I saw that people were listening, people were finally listening to these stories of oppression within America and realizing that it's still there. And they're like, oh my gosh, why haven't we seen this before? I'm like, whoa, okay, people are listening now. And I think it's time to tell my story. But I also didn't want to take away from that movement because that movement is huge. That movement is, 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 is powerful and impactful. And I didn't want to take away from that. And so I actually consulted a bunch of other people of color and I'm like, hey, I have this video idea and, you know, I don't want to take a f take away from this movement. And I know circus is just like this little tiny, like microcosm of of society. But I want to make a change in this. And how do you think it's best to go about this? And they and people actually encourage people of color actually encourage me, like share your experience. Well, definitely, because really the truth about movements like that traditionally they've always been inclusive. The civil rights movement was always inclusive. I mean, Dr. Martin Luther King, his last legacy was the Poor People's March. And of course that was a broad uh, spectrum of Americans, black, white, and otherwise. And in fact, it was mostly white people and he was gonna actually have uh, uh, Americans basically march on Washington and camp out um, right there on, on, on the, the lawn out there. And that was going to be his big legacy. And a lot of people really think his assassination 
it exacerbated the inevitable, which he always felt he would die in that manner because when he started hit, hitting on the economics and you hit on that, that is definitely a very inclusive um, type of thing. But it, it only makes sense that you would feel welcome to express your story because that's how all of this happens is similar to the Me Too movement. You know, one person speaks out and then others feel empowered. So it makes a lot of sense. I want to move on just a little bit. Um, I, I want to, uh, in light of what you're saying, I would like to know from each of you, what would an equitable circus world look like? Um, what are your hopes for it? Can um, I come back to the to the other thing we speak before? Uh, and and I I would like to say sorry for my English because I'm I'm pretty nervous now because this the the stereotype affected my life and that's super hard. Look, in, the, in my first working, uh, the director put me with uh, two women on the in my acting uh, on the floor acting contortion on the floor. Uh, two women in my back, half naked, uh, with samba music, and I do my contortion stuff. And what is super weird, super weird show. In my second working. I do a kind of slavery with chains and aerial chains and stuff like that, and super aggressive character. Like uh, I'm screaming on stage and I do like, uh, I don't know, but it's super weird too. And the always I do the same kind of uh, uh, characters, like or, uh, or, or hyper aggressive person or hyper sexualized. Because I'm always in our shows, I'm or half naked, or not completely, but I just underwear or stuff like that. Why I say this kind of stuff affect my life? Because, for example, when I meet some girl uh, to have a relationship, uh, um, the kind of things really affect my relation because that girl can trust in a black person because uh, always in the media or in shows or whatever, uh, the people say the black people or the black men have uh, need a lot of sex with a lot of people and are always naked and savage, you know, and dangerous and whatever. When the police stop me, it's more aggressive with me because I'm a strong black man, and uh, the 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 and the movies and whatever say the black man is super aggressive and came broken your neck just with one hand or whatever. You know what I mean? I lost two friends uh, with uh, police brutality, and I'm go to the jail here in Europe just to be black, not to be legal. I'm always say that. Because the people say, no, you go to the jail because you're illegal. And I say, no, because the police don't stop me because I'm legal. The police stop me because I'm black. And so when we speak about that, uh, uh, the people say, like Joseph say, you are so sensible. Uh, stop, stop, speak about that. There's something from the past. And I say, no, th that, that kind of thing still affect me and a lot every day yesterday here close of my home and the police start stop black people <laughs> just to say please give me your documentation and it's, it's hard it's hard be be a it's people of color in this siege. world it's a life under siege basically mm. and you're like oh mm. it's like you're a um you're always a man out wherever you go yeah yeah I, that's that's the huge problem and uh, it's not just because we don't want to put a costume or because we don't we don't like samba or mexican music or because we hate kung fu 
Well, I, I love Kung Fu. I love Capoeira. I love Samba. But I don't, I don't think there's the place to put that. Or, or as artist, why I just do that. Right, well, as an artist, your goal is to express yourself as a full human being. Exactly. I, yeah. I'm not just that. I'm not just a, a Samba exotic guy. I'm not exotic. Be exotic is live in Australia and be, be blonde, like 45 degrees outside. That's exotic, or, or or be be blonde with blue eyes in the tropical country. That's exotic. Not me. <laughs> I'm not exotic. I live in tropical country <laughs> because I'm black. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, let me so ask that, you that kind. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm no, no, I'm sorry. It, no, nah, I'm... it's just that 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 kind of stuff. It really affect me in my life, not just on the stage. So yeah, sorry again. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's and that's why we're here. And I, you know, I'm curious to know. I, I, I was, I wanted to know what would an equitable circus world look like for each of you, and um, what are your hopes for it? You know, I, I, it's very odd trying to answer this question because I own a circus. You know, I have a company. Trust me, I didn't want to have to. <laughs> like, Making a show was not in my plans and being the owner of a company was not in my plans, but this is how it ended up because that's the, the, the path my career took. I would love to see representation on stage. Like if we're, like you said, if, if this industry tries to tout itself as being inclusive and diverse, let's see it, make the effort. And you know, that effort comes from up top. It comes from management, it comes from administration. And if there's no people in color up there, how do you expect it? down on stage you know that's why like being the owner of a company i'm so thankful that i make those decisions you know like i'm i i've received submissions from so many artists i've received noelle's admission and i'm sorry for not writing back it came during a very busy time but i received your <laughs> submission so know that but i i got i get submissions from like black indigenous poc a circus artist and i love it and i want to put them on stage it sucks because my show doesn't play as much but I have the opportunity to do that, and I intend to do that. And you know, it's it's a shame. It's a shame that it's this long because, like, now's I think a great time to tell my story. Sorry, I'm gonna hijack this, but like I said, I didn't want to have to be where I'm at because all I wanted to do was work and be on stage. And a, a lot of people have said this to me, and it's not like oh, because I'm so cool. It's like Joe, you were ahead of your time. You know, if you came out now on the circus scene, it'd be a different world. I'm like. You know, that's cool to know, but that doesn't really help because being ahead of my time didn't help me buy a house. You know, like all I wanted to do was work and make money. And because of what happened early on in my career, that was not allotted to me. You know, I, it's about the big company and I'll, I'll say it. Like when I came out of circus school, I had an act that garnered a lot of attention from people, like from several different companies. And I was very fortunate because I appreciated the fact that people like what I did. You know, my goal was to make art, you know, whatever. I wanted to make art and I got noticed for it. I was up for three jobs with Cirque du Soleil, two or three jobs. And you know, when you're up for that many positions, you hope you at least get one, you know? Um, I didn't get any. And I heard and saw who got these jobs. And I, I wrote to casting and I'm like, did I do something? You know, did I do or say something because I thought you guys were wanted this, you know, you guys tell me these things and you talk to me like what happened and they, they're like, come over. Like, so I, I went over, like we, we set up a meeting and I went to a meeting room and this person in casting said, Joe, we love you. You know, like you're the best in the world. You're at the top of our list. But the only way we're going to put you in a show at this company is if there's a role for you in one of our shows and there isn't because they're all female or if an artistic director or creator makes a role for you in their shows. And to be honest, that's probably not going to happen. And so we know you're very talented and we like you, but don't wait for us. We encourage you to go out there and get work and work because you deserve to be on stage. And you know, I, I, I appreciated the fact that they encouraged me, but what that said to me, whether they intended it or not was, what you do is fantastic and worthy of being on stage, but we're not putting you on stage because of who you are. 
And because of that, and but like I said, whether they intended that or not does not matter. It's what it came across as. And for them to not even see that was also like privilege. I was not given the opportunity to work. You know, I didn't have the career that I envisioned for myself. You know, all I wanted to do was be on payroll, get benefits, have insurance, you know, have a secure job. So I don't have to worry about that. That's why I went into this field is because I could have a viable career. It did not happen. It didn't, and I had to struggle, and I still struggled, you know, being in shows where I was tokenized for being Asian. Like what Marco said, when, when your body is just stereotyped in this one thing, like I was, like he was sexy all the time, I was never sexy, because apparently Asians aren't sexy, especially Asian men, you know? And that's a thing even in the, the corporate uh, performing world. They, they hire always women, and you know, great that women can get jobs, but they always hire the, the women who all look the same. You know, I'll say it, they, I, they always hire um, stereotypically pretty white girls with oversplits. And are they good? They're fine. But you know, what, they, what that says is that, you know, if, you, if we're hiring you to be on there, that's what we deem as attractive. And what, that is what we deem as desirable. And it's a marketing thing. And I'm like, so you're saying that you get to decide what's beautiful? So I'm not, and, and like, like queer men of color are not, and people of color in general are not. You just want that all the time, all the time. Okay. You know, like, and, and what are we supposed to do about it? Because there's nobody above them saying otherwise. And this is not to disparage artists who are pretty white girls with oversplits, you know, good for them. They're working. You know, I don't have any concern for them. They're going to work till kingdom come because people love them. And you know what? So do I. They're fantastic. But are they it? They're not everything. There are so many artists of different sizes and colors and ethnicities and cultures that are beautiful, but just not deemed mainstream beautiful because mainstream is white. Mainstream is what the majority is and the majority is white like these are difficult things to say because guess what i might even get ostracized for saying this now by my friends and by my community community by my circus community you know <laughs> if it's a community why are we not looking out for each other like let's call it what it is if you really had our best interests in mind the people in this room if you're looking out for us let us know because we're not hearing i can help you we're not hearing, let me help you. What, what do I need to hear? Even in getting my company off the ground, I received zero help, zero help. I had to do everything myself. I had to pay for everything with the help of my family, of course, thank God they could, but I didn't get any support, moral support. People saying, oh, go do it, go, go, go. good job, go. <laughs> right. I'm like, yeah, but I gotta pay for like insurance. And Well, speaking, <laughs> of, that, speaking <laughs> of that, Joseph, um, what does allyship look like to you, what does allyship look like for you all? I, I'll, since I have the floor, I'll just say it and then I'll shut up for a while. <laughs> I need people who don't look like us to speak up for us because we're tired. We are exhausted of trying to get this message out over and over and over and people not hearing us. Like, I'm so tired. You know, like I, I, I see people, you know, quarantine, it, it messed a lot of things up. It, it pretty much destroyed our industry. And I see people online putting up like, oh, train with me or let's do online classes. I didn't have the energy to do that because of everything that's going on. And then to top all of that, Black Lives Matter happened. And I'm like, oh my God, even heavier. And you know, like, 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 like we said earlier, like I'm not black. So that, that experience, like it's so unfortunate. And it's not like I experienced the same thing exactly because that's, a whole different thing. Do I empathize? I do, because I experience discrimination, but I need people who don't look like us to talk. Because people up top who look like us, like who don't look like us, they won't listen to us anymore. Mm. They won't. Like it's taken this long for them to open up their ears, to, to, to see people die, to be like, okay, now we'll listen to people of color. It's too late. You know, like white people need to do the job because we've been trying to do it and the white people up top don't hear us and they don't want to. And they probably still don't, you know, like circus is in the gutter right now. And it's a shame because we love this art form and it's, it's pretty much decimated because of economics. We have the opportunity to rebuild it. This has to be a part of it. Like 
representation on stage has to be part of rebuilding this art form because if we don't, the art form has failed. It has failed people of color who have looked to this art form as an outlet and a voice for them to express themselves and to express their humanity to the world. And those voices, if they're still stifled, circus is not going to work. That's it. Anyone else? Yeah, um, for me, like, um, I agree that we, it's exhausting, like, I, and even now with the Black, Black Lives Matter uh, movement, people are like being interested in the thing, but it's still kind of untitled. It's like, hey, like the other day somebody, like, she's a good person if you're watching this, you're a good person, but uh, you have internet. You don't need to ask me who I'm exhausted. Oh, but like, like why isn't reverse racism a thing and like because of systems of power and like this you can google you're smart you have the internet just google it's like oh but like you can discriminate against white people and like you can have bias against white people but the system doesn't systematically oppress white people it's not the same uh and like things like that or also for me it's also um how people forget about intersectionality you know like i'm lgbt as well and i am a woman as well and Feminism, it's all white women. So it's all like, yeah, women are more oppressed than men, and I like, but like brown and like queer and like LGBT, it's all white men. And you're like, <laughs> it's like uh, at some point, it's like people are like, and, and then sometimes it might be difficult, for example, in when you talk with uh, like feminists because they're like, we're so oppressed, and you're like, you're still like white, young, pretty, wealthy, European, uh, etc., cetera, et cetera, body able, etc. Like, um, like the concept of intersectionality is also super important. And also um, this, I I really love this um, comparison by, I think he's, I think he's from England, the uh, actor Riz Ahmed. He said like, we talk about diversity and what we need to say is representation because diversity sounds like it's an extra. Like you have the burger and this is the fries. Like it's an extra, it's nice, like it's salt and pepper. And like, no, it's representation. Like people of color exist, queer people of color exist. Uh, women of color is this etc etc and like even us are like super privileged whomever can afford to do circus is probably fairly privileged in general and like i think that's also something that here in europe they have to face the fact that i think um circus is so wide in here because circus is expensive because not everybody can afford a 700 euros steer wheel just to start training to maybe get jobs in a few months four years uh not everybody can afford that and uh and people need to be willing to be uncomfortable. People need to be willing to acknowledge that maybe they have, they've had it easier because, you know, I went to school and we were a bunch of people from a bunch of different countries. Like, for example, you had the, maybe like the Finnish people who were getting 500 euros from the Finnish government every month because they were studying. And you had the Latinos who were, who were like doing circus at the red lights on the weekends. Mm. And it's not that, like, yeah, like sometimes you have it easier. Like, we have it easier than other people and it's just this unwillingness to acknowledge that maybe you've had it easier than other people is really slowing down change because people don't want to feel like we all are like that we all feel like if we're called privileged we're bad people and it's ultimately it's nobody's fault it's just like well, you know, from a system or not there's something you all touched on and you touched on it just a little bit and i want to start wrapping this up unfortunately we have time constraints but i think we can all agree i heard someone really wise say you don't get credit for diversity diversity is what happens to you inclusion mm -hmm. is the goal and so in listening to each and every each person's own reality i think just in this conversation as short as it is because we're not going to solve that problem but it's just so gratifying hearing each person's real story and how they sink and how real it is because i think the industry just has to understand that you know you don't get credit for diversity you, you don't that's what happens to you i think you know we we boast about that in the circuits industry but we don't realize a lot of that diversity has everything to do with well what was necessary not necessarily inclusion and i always judge inclusion based on, well, who's running it? Who's making certain decisions? Who's casting? Who's managing? Who owns it? All those things, because that stuff trickles down. As you said, Joseph, you are a show owner. 
And so you have different sensibilities that somebody who's running CERC might not. And so all of that's very important. What I'd like to ask each of you, let's end on a happy note. <laughs> what are you most proud of in your career? Yes, Noelle. Um, I think I'll just say, okay, so one of them is being able to present. I just as a circus performer, honestly, my favorite thing that I've ever done is to cre creating that YouTube video calling out racism in circus. That honestly is hands down like the, the best decision I have ever made. And I would do it over and over and over again because of the, the, the feedback that it got and and the questions that are being stirred now. But um, just as a circus performer in, chair, in general and as an aerialist, um, I was able to perform on this stage called Le Sehu in Montreal, and I got to perform my solo aerial rope act on that stage, and um, it was really cool to be chosen for that. And that, that, that same act is in the video that um, I presented, and for me, that was a really special opportunity because um, just as, in that story, I talk about how, like, the struggles that I've gone through um, to to become a circus performer, especially starting late and disappointing my family, and and the whole looks thing that we've been we've touched upon, and and I did my act, and throughout the act, you just know when an audience is with you and when they understand you, and and when I took my bow, um, just like all, all the people that were just like standing up and like. And just and and clapping and and just, and like I knew like I knew that they understood and I was able to do like a question and answer and I was able to say in front of all of them what I hope for circus is that every audience member feels represented on stage and that's all that I want is that every walk of life is on stage and so that made me me the most proud because everyone roared in the audience because they want it to and it's not just us as performers who want jobs it's the audience that wants it too. And that's the proudest moment because that was the moment I realized I'm not the only one. Marco? Yeah. Um, I'm proud from my all my career from the beginning to now because I do all by myself. I'm start literally on the street. I'm I'm still training on the street. I every single week I go to the dance break dance with my friends and enjoy of my community. And uh, no one helps me in the in the way of, oh, okay, I'm a huge director and I'm contract to you now. No one. I do the Cirque du Dema and I just train in straps for a year and a half or two years. When I uh, arrive in the stage, I'm competing with people training in Montreal or Ezak or whatever, training three years with teacher and coach and every single one. And I never I never have a coach. I have my friends and just say to me, hey, do that like that and, and leave it. You know what I mean? It's not a real coach. And uh, and I create the concept of my acting by myself. I, I chose the music. My friends saying, oh, bro, don't put this music because it's too intense. So I'm using the strange fruit from Billy Holiday to do my acting, to speak about my history. So I have the opportunity to be voice, and I'm using this opportunity to do something uh, uh, important for me. I don't know to the other persons. For me, it's really important to speak about the racism and the world in general. And uh, I'm always, if you give me voice, I'm speak about this problem because that's the actual problem. So that's, yeah, I feel real great with my career. Awesome. I win, yeah, because that I do all by myself with my friends without help. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. Listen, um, I think this is a good point to end. And I mean, I, I obviously, I think we could probably go on for this for like hours. I, I loved everyone's self. This was this was a truth session. 
And I, I do believe things will be uh, shaking and a quaking. You all may get uh, some interesting messages in your inboxes soon. But uh, hey, that's the risk. That's the wonder. We needed this forum. This is a good point to end because this takes us to our next episode of this panel series, which is on June 23rd, called The Change, um, where we will talk more about the changes that our infrastructure and system requires to create a more inclusive space in the performing arts. So I want everybody to stay tuned to Circus Talk website for the announcement of our panelists. Um, thank you, but unfortunately we're out of time. The wake up call for inclusion is Circus Talk's response to the equality crisis in America. Uh, those of you who may not know, Circus Talk is an inclusive, independent, international online network for the circus industry, providing a massive industry database for jobs, and event listings and circus news. So Circus Talk is now offering a pro membership discount that is 60% off with the coupon code COVID-19 yearly. So that's my messaging. Listen, again, I love to thank all of our wonderful panelists, Marco Mota, Noeli Okoba, YouTube superstar, Joseph Pinzon, who is an impresario all his own, and my Instagram girlfriend, Maho Caceres. I'm your moderator, Jonathan Lee Iverson. It has been such a pleasure to speak with all of these fantastic artists. We are Circus Talk. We'll see you on June 23rd. <laughs>